Hello everyone on YouTube. I've already said hello to people in the chat, um, but welcome to uh, our first, uh, well, my second video lecture. Um, in the uh, first one, I was uh, talking about um, the general overview of the class and kind of the mechanics of it and some stuff about me. Um, and I have a few people who showed up for, uh, for the live lecture. So I'm actually uh, interested in, in asking uh, all of you if you had any uh, questions or um, concerns, uh, anything left over from uh, that video or from looking at the syllabus on your own or anything like that. Any questions you have for me or the or about the class? Mm, mm hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, I think in my video recorder, the sound from other people is not coming through, so I'm going to kind of repeat your question um, for the people who are watching this video later. Uh, you're wondering about the possibility of universal truth, um, right? Yes, yeah. We're going to talk about that. That's one thing I'd like to talk about. Um, I'm thinking in this video lecture, I'm going to focus on the code of intellectual conduct and kind of general philosophical truth-seeking, and then on... Um, on Thursday, I'm going to dive, so we're going to get started with the kind of um, ethical theory stuff, the crash course in ethical theory that I was referencing before. And a lot of the issues about whether there's universal truth or not might be more specific to issues of morality directly. So in other words, we philosophers, there are skeptical people out there who are concerned about whether there's universal objective truth about, say, things in the physical world. If, even if there is a physical world, like philosophers ask these kinds of questions, um, and sometimes there are skeptics out there about that. But um, I'd say for the most part, uh, a lot of Western uh, philosophers are more prone for thinking that uh, there is, of course, objective universal truth about, say, the physical world. Like the stuff that science is investigating, there is objectivity there. But when it comes to things like moral and ethical claims, maybe not as much, right? So you could believe in universal truth on descriptive claims, but not necessarily on normative claims. Um, that's actually a distinction I don't think I've talked about yet. It's a very important one for this class, actually. Um, there's, uh, of all the claims that we can make, of things we want to say are true, they kind of come into these two different flavors. There's descriptive truths, which are truths about... Uh, the way things are, um, the states of affairs in the world, and then there's normative truths, which is claims about things like uh, good, bad, right, wrong, appropriate, inappropriate, beauty gets in there too, uh, basically everything that's like a value judgment or that has any valuative component to it, that's the world of normativity. And the claims of one and the, and the other are kind of separated by this vast logical gap that actually a lot of philosophers talk about as the is-ought gap. Um, you probably have had some thoughts or reflections on this at some point of like, uh, like wishful thinking is irrational, right? Just because something would be good doesn't mean it's going to happen, right? And just because something happens doesn't mean it's actually good. So uh, the way things are and the way they ought to be are two very different matters. So it is possible to have different attitudes about truth depending on what sort of sector of claims we're talking about. Um, are you kind of curious about uh, whether there's objectivity in truth-seeking on the descriptive front, too, or, or just more about the normative stuff? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, well, I want to focus more on the normative because that's what this class is about. It's about ethics. Um, so I would want to do that. And I think I'm going to hold off on that a little bit until the Thursday lecture, if that's okay with you. Um, but there are uh, there is some ways in which the code are, are, is going to get into this. Actually, I'm going to pull it up right now. Um, the the code is going to talk about uh, how there's a standard here for the code itself. It's right at the top of the document. Um, it's got the procedural standard, and it reads um, 
the code wants to be a code that provides the rules that when followed most often lead to one the successful resolution of issues two the most rationally endorsed beliefs and we hope three the truth so I actually um, to skip ahead a little bit in my lecture <laughs> since we're talking about it um, we kind of we'd like to get at the truth we'd like to know how things actually are um, but there's lots of classical philosophical concerns about that and whether we're able to gain knowledge about it even if it exists can we know it um, lots of skeptical concerns very familiar in philosophy but even if we can't have certainty that we are holding the truth in our very hands uh, we can still ask questions about well of the options for what we could believe is true what makes the most sense like and that's what we mean by what's the most rationally defensible so we could look at the arguments or reasons for having this perspective or having this perspective or having this perspective and kind of trying to figure out which one holds up the best to scrutiny and skepticism which one has the most uh, argument and evidence and reasons behind it justifying it and kind of let's go with that right and that can change it's a moving target people have new ideas all the time um, but we can always kind of be at this moment modestly this seems to be the best answer we've got so far so we should go with that and maybe a new one's gonna come along down the road that's gonna be better in which case we'll go with that one if it can prove itself to be more rationally defensible then we'll do that and I think with um, a, a good general way to approach this issue about universal truth with ethics is on the side of like um, what are what are our, what's our best option right we might be really modest um, in our ability to have like infallible access to moral truth like our moral intuitions or our conscience is something we very much rely on to make moral judgments on an everyday basis but we know that the that our conscience is vulnerable it's fallible uh, bias can interfere with it sometimes it can not be wired up properly or it can misfire we can have moral blind spots there's all these kinds of um, ways in which we could be really fallible that way so we might want to, like Falk is saying, try, try to critically reflect as much as we possibly can on our options and what are trying to understand our reasons about why we would choose one set of moral principles or values over another, or trying to figure out which ones should be prioritized the most heavily, um, and maybe we can get some traction on that journey, even even if we're like, yeah, maybe we can't get at the truth. That doesn't answer all the questions sure. for sure because there's kind of the concern about should we even be trying to give answers that apply on this kind of universal level too um but maybe we can save the rest of that for thursday is this kind of satisfying you a little bit cool um any I, I'm, I'm really curious though if i mean you can you can ask any questions you like i that was a great question and it will connect in with what we're doing here with the code of intellectual conduct but I also am I want to make sure that uh, my video was making everything clear for how the class runs because uh, I uh, I don't get to see all of you very often on the online thing so since I got you uh, captive here now thanks for showing up um, I'd love to make sure that that was everything was clear and there wasn't any um, confusion about the like instructions for these assignments or how I'm going to be handling different things with the online format or if you've had any problems with the canvas site I'd like to know silence <laughs> um, well let please let me know I'm I mean uh, like I said in the video yesterday uh, this is my first time doing this class online so it's kind of like building it all out and making sure all the decks are in a row and links are going where they're supposed to and all that kind of stuff so if anything ever pops up uh, and if, if you're watching on YouTube later here you know send me an email get in contact with me somehow send me text messages and I'll try to get things fixed as quickly as possible um, I did want to kind of start and um, clarify some things here before we dive into the code of intellectual conduct um, I'm pulling up the course syllabus right now um, I just want to clarify what I'm asking everyone to do right now in the class like what's happening this week um, and uh, what's gonna be happening next week so the class is going to kind of start a little slow. 
uh, well, I guess I shouldn't say slow because uh, <laughs> it's going to be jam-packed. But in terms of the assignments, there's not as much stuff that I'm requiring out of you or that's mandatory. Um, so, oh, here's a question. Oh, Sophie had a question about the quiz. Yeah, in the first video, I, I did goof on that. Um, I forgot to give a code word. I'm not going to forget tonight. <laughs> I'm going to do it a little bit later, but I forgot to give a, a code word. But the quiz that's up online is uh, has a replacement question that if you watch the video, you should be able to answer it. Um, and don't worry too much about how uh, close or accurate it is. If you're in the ballpark, I'm going to be able to tell that you watch the video. Um, but it's a, it's a question about the things I was saying about Falk's paper, actually. Um, so there there is a question up there that should be able to be answered by you. Uh, so go for it. If you have any problems with taking that quiz um, or you're not sure about it, let me know and we can sort that out. Um, okay. Um, so with uh, with what you're up to right now so the first part of the class is not kind of going at full speed in terms of the assignments and the regular rhythm of things with like the reading common assignments and the journal assignments and all that kind of stuff this first part of the class is going to be really like setting the stage and giving us a foundation for doing everything else and um, I think I might have mentioned in the video yesterday um, I'm, I'm kind of a I'm on the camp that thinks that ethical theory is pretty important that if you want to understand uh, ethical issues surrounding really particular like contemporary affairs um, or applied settings like like in the business world um, you need to have a, this kind of conceptual vocabulary of what things should be on the moral radar at all like what are the things that we could possibly be morally sensitive to so I'm really I'm really going to be um, front-loading a bunch of theory into this this uh, class at the beginning of the quarter. I'm not sure exactly how long it's going to take. Um, it is going to be kind of like a crash course, um, but we'll try to get it through it as quickly as we can, and I think we'll be able to get a good jump on it starting on Thursday. Um, and maybe maybe we'll be done by the end of next week, maybe a little bit longer than that, um, but uh, there's a lot of stuff that I, I just, we just can't skip. I, I think it'd be very important, especially because most of the time in this class, um, this is the first philosophy class, uh, most of the students have taken. Um, I'm not teaching the class with any kind of expectation that you've taken some philosophy in the past. Anyone in the uh, chat room here, have you taken any philosophy before? Mm-hmm. What did you take? Contemporary moral problems or... Yep, yeah. Cool. And chat saying this is first first class and for someone else uh was that man the messages just like disappear right as they show up. Uh, someone said this was a second philosophy class they took. I think that might have been Sophie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What was the other class that you took, Sophie? Aha, cool. Um so if you've taken any philosophy like 101 um, some of the stuff I'll probably be talking about with the Code of Intellectual Conduct might sound familiar, and just the kind of way in which philosophy is all about debate. <laughs> um, uh, I think I think some of this will look familiar. It is very hard. Yes, I agree with you, Sophie. Uh, philosophy is some of that they are always the most challenging classes that I ever took as a student too. The reading is really tough. Um, the writing is very tough. Yeah, a lot of writing. Yep, um, and a different kind of writing too, like. It's easy to just kind of write about your opinion, blah, 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 blah. That's not hard. But having to, like, uh, craft a position and put arguments together and try to get inside the head of people who disagree with you and respect them properly and charitably and still have a response to what they have to say, I mean, it's, it's really – it's a demanding stuff. Um, Falk talks about uh, in his paper about how reasoning, he thinks, is testing your whole person – against these questions. So I, I think it is true that philosophy pulls on all sort of aspects of us. 
um, and, and challenges us on every level, including emotional. I've always been very challenged emotionally with philosophy too, not just imagination and intellect and analytic stuff or yeah that it's it's all over the place so um i do think this class is gonna be challenging like i said in my video yesterday um if you've taken um 102 before uh then some of this stuff might sound kind of familiar like the ethical theories we're going to start with did you read some kant mill and aristotle a little bit Cool. Well, we're, it's always good to get a refresher. Uh, I definitely have, I've read those readings so many times, I could never even count them. And I always get something more out of them. I'm like, how did I miss that? Like, <laughs> that's a cool thing. Um, there's always something else in there. They're really dense and they're, and they're pretty deep. They're, there's a treasure trove. Whether you agree or disagree with them, um, they really help us. I, 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 po I picked those because I think they're the most efficient time spent. And, and they're the most commonly talked about in philosophy, too, in that they're going to put a lot of things on the radar for us, of things that to just generally be sensitive to when it comes to any ethical debate. Um, but I'm not taking anything for granted with this class, so kind of setting things up is something I wanted to do. So, after all that blabbing, I wanted to make it crystal clear that right now what I'm expecting you to do is just the first week writing assignment, the first week writing activity, I think is what I called it, on Canvas. Um, I want you to do that. I want you to read the Code of Intellectual Conduct. I want you to watch these videos and submit the code quizzes things um, to get credit for that. And then everything else here is kind of optional. So um, going back to the syllabus here, um, all the stuff that's in introductory material and classical ethical theories, this is all uh, readings that are optional. They're up on Canvas. They're in the files section. And actually, I can even show that on the video here, uh, if you're watching this on YouTube here. Um, there's, in the ethical theory folder, you'll find all of these documents um, there for you to take a look at. Now, I'm not intending you to read all of them. That would be way, way, way too much. Uh, kind of part of what I'm doing here is giving you a bunch of resources that are not, uh, I'm not expecting you to read all now, but just that if you want to go kind of uh, a little bit more and going more in depth on some of the stuff you've got some resources to do that uh, or if you're curious about it and you want to explore it more than we talked about it you've got these primary sources to go to like right there um, I do recommend uh, in terms of if you're gonna pick some stuff to read my main recommendations would be um, the grounding of the metaphysics of morals by Kant Utilitarianism by Mill, and Nicomachean Ethics by Aristotle, but only certain sections of them. And I actually have, um, I'm going to post a little announcement after I get done with the video here tonight. Um, it's kind of like the first announcement for the class, and I'm going to recommend certain selections out of those readings, because reading the whole thing would take a long time. But they're little, if you've got the time for it, there are definitely little selections that I would recommend. And my plan is to talk about Mill first, then go to Kant, and then do Aristotle. So if you kind of want to do the these recommended readings as we go, that's the order in which I'm planning on talking about them in these lectures. So, um, so that's recommended. But there's not a lot that's required right now. Um, so my my main advice and kind of my reason for doing this is I just want you to kind of sit back and absorb as much as you can. As you have time to do some supplemental reading outside of class, out of, out of the official stuff, great, awesome, go for it. Um, all of my lecture notes are up on Canvas 2 in the file section, so you can get summaries of what's going on here that I'll be using uh, as part of my lectures. Um, and uh, so if you want a reference for some stuff of like main points, main ideas, uh, they're there. They're kind of still written like lecture notes, but I think they'll probably be useful to you as a reference too if you want to take a look at those. Um, so that's just to clarify what's going on. I think starting next week, um, I'll, uh, we will do a journal entry. I think we're going to start journals just to kind of keep you active a little bit and getting some practice at philosophical writing. I think I think that would be a not a bad idea. Um, but uh, there aren't any reading a uh, reading comment assignments yet. It's when we hit here uh, the first major unit um, of business ethics, the fiduciary duty topic, that we're going to go with the kind of full plan. Um, that I describe in the syllabus for all the different assignments that we're going to be doing. Um, 
that feeling making sense for everyone in the chat? Cool. All right. Okay. So um, the main order of business uh, here today is going to be to talk about the code of intellectual conduct. Um, and I'm going to try to keep this moving along, but I have a lot to say about this document, even though it's so short. Um, I actually gave a conference presentation on using this document to teach the kind of system of critical reasoning and just teaching critical reasoning generally to students uh, who are taking philosophy courses. And I, I've got a lot of kind of opinions about it. Um, and the document that I gave you is one of my favorite articulations of this kind of list of intellectual virtues, but it's not the only one. And I even also don't think it's perfect, too. I've been tempted to kind of write my own. Uh, and sometimes students have asked me in the past, they're like, Tim, if you've got all these criticisms of this, why don't you just write your own and give us that to read instead? <laughs> um, but I kind of like sticking with this one from this philosopher named Edward Damer because I think it's somewhat instructive to kind of say, hey, we can critically reason about critical reasoning. Like, I, I like what this person has said. I think they're making a lot of good contributions to how we should think about orienting in context of disagreement. But uh, hey, we can keep talking about that too. This is always an open conversation. That's one of the things that makes philosophy a little different than other um, areas of inquiry is that uh, it everything's up for debate. Like no philosopher is going to be like, nope, can't talk about that. That's off limits. We've settled that. We're never bringing, we're not opening up that case again or anything like that. Everything's always up to be challenged. Now, if you want to challenge it, we're going to ask you for arguments and we're going to test it and everything and run it through that kind of accountability. Um, but everything is open to question, including me. And I encourage you to do that as a course in the, uh, as a part of the, cl the class during the quarter. Um, if you're disagreeing with some of the things I'm saying, um, that's, I'm always game for that. I mean, I got no problems with that. You, I'm not ever worried about, uh, maybe I shouldn't say this, but <laughs> I was, I, I'm always tempted to say, I'll just say it. Um, I don't really care whether my students respect me or not. Like I'm not in this game of teaching for, uh, respect. Um, I'm, I like to go on the journey of truth seeking with you and that's way more important. So don't worry about offending me or like challenging me or something like that. Um, oh, a uh, little quick thing. Uh, sorry, your name is truncated. Is that Alejandro? Is that your name? Yeah. Um, can you actually mute your microphone? It's kind of buzzing in my ears a little bit. Uh, except when you want to talk, of course, because I want to hear from you. Um, cool. Thank you. I was starting. I started to notice. I was starting to shout a little bit more. So I don't want to wake up my baby because he's sleeping. Um, so. Um, where was I? Uh, oh yeah, don't have to worry about um, me taking it as a slight or something if you're challenging anything I'm going to say. And I, I will actually throw out some of my opinions and my own philosophical perspectives as we go. Um, usually in the kind of classroom th setting, um, and maybe it'll happen here with the people dropping in for the video lectures. Um, you know, there's a lot of conversation happening and I'm always encouraging students to take risks and be vulnerable. Like put your ideas out there, even if people might challenge them and get into debate and all that kind of stuff. Um, I'm always kind of encouraging students to take uh, some of that vulnerability out there. And I want to match that too. It'd be really weird and unfair for me to ask my students to be vulnerable and yet I'm not willing to do that too. So every once in a while I'll definitely throw in my two cents. And if students ask about it, I'm not going to say no too. Uh, sometimes I'll do something like turn my hat to like indicate that I'm just talking as not with any authority as a teacher or something like that, but I'm just a person who wants to talk with you. <laughs> uh, other times I'll be like, okay, I can tell you about Kant or something, right? Um, so I'll, I'll sometimes indicate that when I'm uh, presenting something that's more controversial or more just kind of my um, individual philosophical outlook on things. But, so, but I'll do that too. Um, uh, so yeah, so we want to critically think about critical thinking. And I, um, as much as possible, especially for those of you who are in the chat here tonight, um, if you've got some ideas about these principles and how you think it could be, how the code could be improved or what, what you think would be a really good idea for how to adjust it or what would you want people to be agreeing to as a part of trying to set us up for success in an intellectual debate. Um, 
there is going to be opportunity in this class, even though we're not together in a classroom, there are going to be these discussion boards and there's going to be opportunity to interact together. And how we interact together matters. Um, it does matter. And the code is talking about all that kind of stuff. Uh, so <clears throat> I do want you to kind of think about it almost like a contract that uh, I'd like us to have sort of ideally have some kind of consensus that like, yeah, we'd want to do this. So if you don't like the terms of the contract, we can talk about that. Um, I'm, I'm teaching a section of critical reasoning, the class, uh, this quarter, Philosophy 115. And in that class, um, since the whole class is just about critical reasoning, um, I'm going to do a discussion with them tomorrow using the code too, where I'm going to ask them, um, what did they, what's on their radar as far as uh, the possible risks that they might be concerned about, but also the possible advantages of kind of operating in this mode of critical reasoning to uh, take a kind of critical attitude uh, toward life, um, to be like judging things and trying to weigh them and evaluate them all the time, hold them accountable, uh, and relying on reason as a way of uh, making decisions about what to believe and how to act, what to value. And we've got a lot of ways of doing those things. We've got a lot of ways we could decide what to believe and what we're going to do. We don't necessarily have to do it as critical reasoners. So I think it's worth thinking about why would we want to do it as critical reasoners? Why do we want to use that paradigm? I'm, I'm fond of saying that these sort of standards of logic are not just um, like the rules of how thought works, people. But it's really an ethical paradigm. It's, it's, a, it's a lifestyle. And there's other ways we could live not that way. So I think we need to hold it accountable to that. Uh, and think about what its limits are. What, when is it maybe not the right tool for the job? When is it not the right answer for a situation? I'm always fond of saying sometimes people don't need arguments, they need hugs. And that's kind of like a, a kind of a trite way of putting the sentiment. But, you know, there are limits to when and where to use critical reasoning. At least I think so. That said, I'm pretty confident about it, and I think it's very, very valuable, and oftentimes is exactly the right tool for the job. But I think it's good for us to think about that. Um, I definitely am familiar with how um, students and just people in general come to the idea of having an open, critical debate with a lot of different feelings and a lot of different expectations and um, assumptions about what that means and how to do it and what how it should be done. Um, and some of us um, might honestly be a little um, gun shy about it too. And I totally understand that. Uh, I've been talking about that for many years since I started teaching, but man, that sentiment feels more relevant today now more than ever uh, with the kind of way in which public discourse can get kind of toxic. So um, thinking about how do we want to do this, um, if there are some advantages here, but there are also some concerns, how can we get the good without the bad? So I'm, we're not going to have a big discussion about that here tonight uh, in sense of me asking you questions and doing that kind of brainstorming thing like I'm going to do with my 115 students. But I wanted to share that as kind of a backdrop for what the purpose of the Code of Intellectual Conduct is. In many ways, I think the Code is an attempt to try to set some guidelines uh, or some direction or some vision about how we want to act in debates when we're exploring our disagreement and perspectives and beliefs and values with each other. Uh, how do we want to act so we can get the good without the bad? How can we enjoy all the advantages that this uh, opportunity has to offer without um, falling into the traps of the liabilities that also can come with the space too? Um, so that's kind of a little bit of stage setting for why we're doing this. Um, I Philosophers, like I, I think I was saying in yesterday's video, they're looking for trouble. They're always interested in what we disagree about, uh, the where the controversies are, rather than just collecting a bunch of truisms and trivial things that we all agree to. Um, but trying to figure out um, the deeper, more sticky, pernicious things. And when we're talking about those controversies in the world of ethics, I mean, we're talking about uh, the kind of stuff that really cuts to our core. Um, if we have a debate about, say, my philosophical theory of time, and you, you know, create some pretty big objections to me and my perspective and my theory um, that I'm not sure how to deal with, that might cause me some anguish or maybe embarrassment or something. There's still all those opportunities for those kinds of anxieties. But, man, if I tell you about my kind of core values and what I find meaningful in life, and you shoot that down with a bunch of objections, that, like, that hits a little closer to home. Um, so... 
oftentimes the things that are they're most important for us to talk about in ethics are, are uh, the things that are hardest to talk about. So anything we can do to kind of set up some support to enable us to have open, candid uh, debates with each other is something that I think is worth spending a good amount of time trying to set up. And that's why I'm going to talk quite a bit about the code here. Um, so let me um, pull this up. Uh, if, if For those of you in the chat, uh, if you want to follow along, um, I'm just going to be looking at the Code of Intellectual Conduct here. Uh, for those of you watching this on YouTube, it should show up on your screen right now. Um, and we got a little start here talking about um, the sort of the the way that Edward Damer, this philosopher who wrote this Code of Intellectual Conduct, this formulation of it, um, how he's framing the code itself. Uh, he's saying, hey, this code is important in as much as it's able to satisfy these two goals that we have, what he calls the procedural standard and the ethical standard. So we were just talking a second ago about the procedural standard and how um, our goal here is to try to get at the truth. Um, a, a critical debate has as its objective um, getting a better idea of what we ought to believe on whatever subject we're talking about. Um, and and we want to we want to know what's actually true about uh, about all these big philosophical questions. This applies not even just to philosophy, but to just about any kind of inquiry that we do in in other kinds of disciplines. Um, so we want to get at the truth. And there's some things that are going to make that complicated, and we've got some ways to deal with that. But that's kind of like the product that we're hoping to come away with. And there's definitely ways that we can behave in debates that are not going to be so productive. Um, like uh, one of the principles on the code is about relevance. So, you know, if we're going off on irrelevant tangents in the debate, that's not going to help us, right? So there's certain things like that that um, we'd want to keep an eye on uh, that would be standards about what proper argumentation would look like. But the I'm really happy with this particular formulation because Edward doesn't forget about the ethical stuff too. Um, when we're having a debate with each other, this is another activity that's a part of human life. Um, and it's a social activity. It's interpersonal. Um, it's a part of our interactions. And just because we're talking about theoretical matters or intellectual matters uh, or about the truth itself, that doesn't mean that this is somehow a ethical free zone, that it doesn't matter how we treat each other. There are still things we care about here, too, other than just getting at the truth. Um, I was talking with my other business ethics class uh, this afternoon about this idea and uh, in our conversation we kind of came up uh, maybe you've heard this phrase from people before that hey it's not offensive if it's true you ever heard that phrase before <laughs> yeah see the smile yeah um, that in my opinion is a bullshit that is definitely bullshit uh, because it's obviously the case that you could talk about truths in ways that are ethically inappropriate um, that's definitely another thing that's on the radar here. But I have noticed that uh, of all the spheres of human life that we seem uh, least interested in holding ethical and moral measuring sticks to, uh, truth seems to be one of them. That it's kind of like, well, if truth's on the table, then I don't have to worry about all this other stuff. Or kind of this idea that if the uh, kitchen's too hot, or the cooking's too hot, get out of the kitchen kind of thing. If you can't handle it, you know, like if we're going to be truth seekers, got to have a thick skin because your ego is going to get bruised. You know, we're going to throw around some punches and objections and stuff, and you can't be too attached to your beliefs. And that whole perspective, I don't agree with. It's got kind of a half truth to it. Uh, there is there is some truth to what I think that perspective has coming from it, but there's also a lot that is also bullshit in my in my opinion. I don't think that being a truth seeker requires sacrificing some of our ethical values, uh, specifically values around respect, respect for each other. Um, all the kinds of ways that people try to uh, maybe pursue uh, debate and truth seeking um, in a way that crosses ethical lines I think is actually not contributing anything productive to truth seeking and not because it's unethical. It's just that just if you looked at that behavior that we're calling unethical or that would kind of cross some of those boundaries and ask what is this contributing to the debate? It's usually nothing. Or there's usually some other way to take the contribution that it is making and articulate that or share that in the conversation in a way that's not offensive. 
uh, or that's not disrespectful or that isn't treating or uh, being, basically being abusive to each other. Um, I don't think that truth seeking is an excuse for abuse. Um, and I'll be, I don't usually have that problem with teaching at Bellevue College, but, um, you know, if things get nasty on the discussion forums, I'm not going to allow that to happen. I'll, I'll definitely step in about that. Um, I, there's only been a couple times in the seven years I've been teaching at Bellevue College where I've really had to deal with that um, in a classroom. Um, but uh, I, I, I very firmly subscribe to the idea that, uh, like Edward is sharing, that there are two things we care about here more than anything else. We want to get at the truth. That is something we care about deeply. And we also care about how we do that, the means that we get to that end. And I want to add to what Edward's saying that I don't think that there's any way in which doing one of them means not doing the other. I think they really go together. And maybe one um, way that will sort of help with me articulating this vision. Um, for a long time now, uh, I've been teaching the Code of Intellectual Conduct as a part of my classes for a very, very long time. And that's why this unit kind of gets bigger and bigger, because I always think of more ideas that are important, because I spent a lot of time uh, thinking about it. Um, but one way I've, I, what I've sort of landed on is, like, uh, if I wanted to sum up the whole code of intellectual conduct in just, like, a sentence, I would say that the code is presenting a vision for how we engage in argumentative debate with each other in which it's a cooperative model of truth-seeking rather than a competitive one. It's kind of flipping the script on debate. That debate is not an intellectual wrestling match where there are winners and losers. There's, if we're doing it right, there's only winners. Right? If you go into a debate with a position, and we have the debate, and your position, my position that I came with gets uh, debunked, or there's another position that turns out to be uh, better in terms of its argumentative and rational justification, um, then that's a win. I didn't lose. Uh, my position is maybe no longer the one that we see as the most defensible one. Um, but me, personally, I win. Because now I come away with the debate with a better idea than the one that I started with. That's not a loss. Um, that's a win. And even if me and, and somebody else, or you and somebody else you're having a debate with, even if you disagree about the most fundamental matters, if you can connect around these two values about truth-seeking and ethical concerns for each other, predominantly through, the I think, the value of respect, then no matter what else you disagree about, you can be on the same side of your activity of having that debate, even when you disagree so deeply with each other. Um, as long as that's kind of understood, and there's sincerity there, and there's trust in that sincerity, then you can go to the most dangerous, risky places in that debate, and it's going to be okay. Uh, and I've done this personally very many times. Um, all the kinds of that when I when I think of, in my experience of like the risks of critical debate and sometimes when you like start a conversation with someone you're like uh oh do I want to be in this do I want to have this debate with this person <laughs> most of the time those concerns uh, show up in my experience in cases where there isn't this kind of understanding about what we're here to do and why we're doing it um, that's connecting on those values uh, that it is a competitive model rather than a cooperative one so it, I think the once that switch is made, once you go from competition to cooperation with your opponent, your opponent's your best friend, actually, uh, as, if, as a truth seeker, then all the principles on the code start making a lot more sense and might even come naturally. Like, you might not even have to look at the code or, or talk about these intellectual virtues if you just have that little switch turned on, that you'll kind of naturally be led to a lot of those behaviors. I don't, I don't know when you're reading the Code of Intellectual Conduct, uh, those of you in the chat, um, but I'm, I'm guessing some of that stuff probably sounded familiar, like it wasn't totally new. Um, if you've uh, had positive experiences in debate with people in the past, my guess is um, the, those conversations were characterized by you and them sort of playing by some of these rules, or maybe even without knowing it. Um, so I think that makes all the difference in the world, uh, whether you're looking at it cooperatively or competitively um, is a big deal. And even with the stuff that can be like, um, like I said, the half-truth, I, I thought there was a half-truth to this sentiment about you got to have a thick skin to be a truth seeker kind of thing. And the half-truth there is that we do have egos. And egos uh, can very much hijack the truth seeking process. And we'll talk about that with one of the first principles on the code, the truth seeking principle. Um, 
And well, there, uh, I, I might have mentioned in the video yesterday, I count myself about equal parts Lutheran and Buddhist. And one of my favorite Buddhist philosophers is a philosopher named Chogyam Trungpa. And uh, he's, he's great for these like snarky little quotes. <laughs> uh, he's, he's kind of a clever, cl he has a clever tongue. Um, and one of my favorite quotes from him is that the purpose of a spiritual friend is to insult you. So like someone who is supposed to be helping you uh, live a life of peace and compassion and truth and justice and sincerity is someone who is going to insult you. They're going to insult your ego. They're going to offend your ego. And I think that is something to kind of be prepared for um, with philosophical truth seeking. That's one of the things that makes it challenging. You're asked to really step in with your opinion and your and your deepest thoughts and feelings about matters of great importance. And yet you're also asked to kind of like take some criticism and um, be vulnerable to replies and encountering other perspectives and things like that. And even for, I think most of us are pretty sincere in that we, we do care about the truth. We don't want to just be closed-minded dogmatists. I don't know very many people who are like, yep, I'm closed-minded, proud of it. You know, like we all like to think of ourselves as being open-minded. Um, but what that really asks of us is sometimes quite a challenge. Um, it's not an easy thing to do. And I definitely have a lot of understanding and compassion for that. And I think it's it's wise to do that with a conversational partner, which is another big thing I wanted to say here at, at the early running here at the code, um, specifically about, oops, that's the wrong document. There we go. In terms of cashing out this ethical principle, um, part of, I think, treating each other ethically in context of debate, uh, context of disagreement, is recognizing that we're not going to be perfectly rational. Um, even if we're, we are aware of the code, and we're in full agreement with it, we think this is the right thing to do, we're not going to follow it perfectly. We're going to make mistakes about that. And I think there needs to be some understanding, uh, recognizing just how what we're, be, what we're asking of ourselves and each other if we're going to interact this way, and doing everything we can to support each other. Um, another thing about the kind of competitive model of debate that really is a missed opportunity is how it's sort of like, you handle your shit, I'll handle my shit, and we'll let the chips fall where they may. Kind of like um, the courtroom with lawyers, right? You got a defendant, you've got the prosecutor, they're going to give it everything they got and let the jury decide kind of thing, right? And there's a lot that we can do to support each other in meeting the challenges of being sincere, authentic truth seekers. Um, but if we're really working in that kind of like you versus me mode, then we don't get that support. Um, so actually, oh, okay. So I have so many things to talk about. Um, how are we doing so far in the chat? How are you, if, feel free to jump in with questions at any point. Um, am I making pretty good sense so far? Cool. I'm gonna give it a, a couple seconds to see some things in the in the message bubbles. Actually, you know, maybe a good convention here would be. Because uh, sometimes it takes a little while to type out a thing in the in the text, uh, the written text. If you've got something that you want to say, maybe um, just uh, send me a message that says hand, like raising your hand kind of, uh, really quickly so that I know to kind of stop and wait and listen um, rather than get rolling on something else that I'm going to talk about. So if I know, I know a message is coming, like you're typing it and it's on its way kind of thing. Um, and then I, I'll, I'll make sure I don't get distracted on something else and have to jump back. Uh, sound good? Cool. Awesome. I think that's a good convention. Yeah. Wonderful. Okay, so um, next thing I wanted to talk about, and this is a little bit longer of a tangent, but I think it's worth it, and it has a little bit more to do with the ethical uh, component of the Code of Intellectual Conduct. We're just cruising through this material, right? <laughs> There's so much to talk about. Um, I'm very influenced by a existentialist uh, kind of theologian philosopher named Paul Tillich. He was one of the first philosophers I actually studied way back in high school. And he popped up again when I actually gave that conference presentation about teaching critical reasoning. And he wrote this book called The Courage to Be, which is all about existential anxiety uh, and fear. And, and uh, the kind of different conceptions, philosophical conceptions of courage that humans have come up with in the centuries to meet these different, what he thinks are sort of basic fears that are part of just being an existing person. And the three fears that are on his radar, and so he doesn't think these things are like 
culturally relative. Maybe cultures emphasize them in different ways. But, I mean, Tillich really believes these things are basic. And I'm kind of inclined to agree with him. I, I, I'm, I think I am... It's kind of always a tough thing to make a claim like that. It's a pretty big claim to make. But um, tentatively, modestly, I've been, I think I kind of agree with this. But the three big categories of anxiety that Tillich has on his radar is fear of death and destruction. So kind of like in, like in Buddhism, impermanence, how everything is going to be destroyed at some point. Entropy is going to whittle down anything that we care about. Um, we're going to die. Our loved ones are going to die. Uh, projects that we work on and construct monuments they're eventually going to come to ruin everything like eventually the heat death of the universe right all that kind of stuff so impermanence death and destruction uh, meaninglessness and inauthenticity so that's a concern about like maybe there isn't any point or purpose to existence at all maybe everything is arbitrary or chaotic um, or absurd um, concerns about authenticity are often kind of connected with freedom things so like Maybe think, um, uh, you know, as you grow up and you're trying to maybe uh, step out from the shadow of your parents, you might start to be, like, aware of how they've influenced you or that the culture that you've grown up in has influenced you or biased you. And, it, and you can sometimes wonder, like, is my life my own? Like, am I just doing what other people are telling me to do? Or am I being influenced by factors that I didn't really choose? What does it mean to not be superficial as a person? Um, or to not be dissociated from my own life. Um, what does it mean to really live and make true choices about what I actually care about for myself? There's a lot, that's a classic kind of realm of, of uh, anxiety and angst in existentialism. And I'm sure in some way that kind of anxiety has touched you in your life at some point too. When people have midlife crises, they're, they're having concerns about that kind of stuff. And then the third one that Tillich talks about is moral culpability. A fear that I might be evil or bad or the kind of the way in which you you sometimes maybe make choices in your life that you regret later um, but they don't necessarily like hang on you really deeply but if you've ever done something that's like deeply immoral like you've harmed someone intentionally or treated something someone very poorly uh, or lied or something like this uh, in a moment of moral weakness that kind of like can gnaw on you like you're you're carrying the weight of your sins on your heart um, and you're like, am I actually a good person? Um, this kind of anxiety can also show up with things like, um, can I meet standards of expectation? Whether that's uh, external, like like what your parents want you to do to have a successful life or what society is saying, or even the things that are internal um, that might be hit a little closer to home. Like if I disappoint myself, that can weigh on me pretty heavily too. Or I might be afraid of disappointing myself of not meeting my own expectations for how I think I, I ideally ought to be. We fail at doing that all the time, too. Um, and the reason I'm talking about all this right now is not to do, throw all this doom and gloom into our class uh, about existentialism, but because at one point I recognized that the space of critical debate kind of pushes all those trigger buttons in us. Um, if I go into a debate with sincerity as a truth seeker who's going to be cooperatively aligned here, not competitively aligned, um, or maybe I might be competitively aligned too, but as maybe a defense mechanism, um, I'm going to be concerned about whether my beliefs get destroyed. I'm attached to my beliefs. I like my perspectives. I don't want to change, right? I, I might. It might be sad to see my pet projects or pet theories uh, just get ground up in a bunch of objections from people who are thinking about it more than me. Um, that's always a fear. As a definitely in professional philosophy, you write a, pu a paper, publish it, and then people just tear it to shreds, you know. And you're like, ah, dang it, I worked so hard on that. But even when we're just having normal debates, um, oh, a question: Can we seek the truth without disagreement? Um, by the way, Alejandro, you can totally use the uh, audio microphone way to respond to. You don't have to use the chat thing, um, but I can handle that too. Um, I. Yeah, we can explore the, uh, the truth without disagreement, but usually it means manufacturing it. So in other words, let's say you and I are having a conversation, and I'm like, so I really think this is true. And you're like, yeah, totally. I think that's true too. And it's like, cool. You know, whatever, right? But if we wanted to do some truth seeking about that, then one or the other of us or both of us might have to be like, so... Let's play devil's advocate a little bit. Why might someone not be think the way that we do? 
You know, why, what are, why would other people think differently about this? What's motivating them? What are their concerns? What are their arguments? What's their evidence? And then maybe we can think about what we would say against that uh, or how to maybe respond to those concerns or maybe end up saying, oh, wait a second, I hadn't thought about that. Hmm, maybe we have to change our position about that too. Um, so it, it requires some kind of um, exploration of disagreement. That's where, the, that's where the kind of cutting edge is, is the stuff that is controversial that we don't have, that we're not on the same page about. Does that, what, what do you think of that? Does that sound about right? Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, even before we get to, like, doing uh, uh, devil's advocate kind of stuff, um, I mean, it's a real challenge to just even sometimes design a position, to, like, figure out what is my opinion about something. So sometimes you can have co uh, critical conversations that are just about, you know, sorting that out. Um, I do this with students all the time working on paper projects, where I'm not necessarily trying to, uh, you know, defeat your ideas or something like that, but just trying to uh, brainstorm and help you find the words to articulate what your feelings are, your intuitions are telling you about some issue in philosophy. Um, and that's its own can be its own kind of critical journey too. Usually a lot of the choices that you make are informed by a recognition of the possible debates that could happen though, um, the, the opportunities for disagreement as well. Um, so yeah, I, I, uh, I think all these different anxieties of non-being that Paul Tillich talks about, that's his phrase for them, anxieties of non-being, um, really connect with critical debate space. We don't want our positions destroyed. That's kind of like the first category. Um, when we hold ourselves critically accountable for our perspectives, it might not be pretty what we find when we look inside. We might discover, oh, I don't have any good reasons for that position. <laughs> like, I might be shown to be a faker if I really put myself into this vulnerable position of open critical debate. Um, so in that way, there might be the concerns about inauthenticity, right? Um, I might discover my biases. I might recognize uh, that, oh, hey, there's some patterns to my thinking here that are not based on argument. They're not based on evidence. This isn't about reasons. This is about something else. Uh, maybe I find my own ego involved in that, um, or I uh, understand my own arrogance in a deeper way than I did before. Um, I've found that philosophy is, um, while in some cases, something that promotes narcissism, and that's definitely the case, it also can be one of the best weapons against narcissism. Um, but, and not to throw so much Buddhism in here, but another favorite phrase from Buddhism is that, it kind of is more traditional Buddhism, not, not other stuff, not necessarily like Zen, but some very traditional Buddhist uh, ideas are that the mind is like the best friend or your worst enemy. It can be either one. It can be one of the most powerful weapons uh, to combat inauthenticity, and it can also be a pretty big weapon for inauthenticity through like rationalizing. Like the line between sincere truth seeking and rationalizing can sometimes be a really fine one. Um, and then also uh, getting into critical debate definitely, I think, provokes anxieties about um, moral culpability. And the, um, I mean, just look at the. Um, culture of discourse today, um, we moralize truth a whole lot, even at the same time that it might seem like, you know, with all the fake news kind of stuff that we don't really care about the truth. I mean, it's kind of like everyone is deeply caring about the truth, but there's sort of this um, unwillingness to really explore that critically as an open discussion, more like demonizing your opponent kind of thing, that they're ignorant, they're biased, they're misguided, um, evil, like all sorts of things, right? Um, so whether you've got the right idea or you're informed or you've got the right arguments or the, you know, all this sort of stuff, whether you're on the right side is definitely a space that we heavily moralize. Um, and, uh, there's definitely very similar things about general moral accountability and accountability and ethical debate that sort of map up. Like that's the whole point of debate is to share our perspectives and hold them critically accountable. Um, they're going to be judged, they're going to be evaluated, and it's very easy for us to confuse our ego with those things too, and to kind of take it personally um, when our ideas come attacked. It's like, well, if my ideas get disproved, then what does that say about me? Um, am I maybe losing respect or something like that? In the syllabus, I, in a pithy moment, I say, uh, for our purposes, respect can't be a conclusion, but it has to be a premise. 
And that's what I kind of mean here with um, the ethical standard on the code of intellectual conduct too, that um, we need to uh, start by giving respect freely and then just exploring ideas for their merits, that the person gets the respect. Um, that doesn't mean you have to agree with all the ideas, but you're going to respect the person, listen to what they have to say, and try to put the best construction on it that you can. Uh, that's philosophical charity. That's one of the principles on the code we'll be talking about too. Okay, so that's a whole lot of stuff about the ethical side. Um, there's even more that I have to say about respect. Um, to, I'm definitely, we're already getting at about an hour here, and I don't want to keep us too far past 10, because um, that's what I'm kind of hoping for, kind of planning on two hours here. Um, so I'm going to kind of move things along. But if you're curious and you want to talk about it more, let me know. But I'll, I'll just share this idea really quickly. Um, respecting people does not mean agreeing with them. I do think that respect requires listening. That's the first step of respect. Um, you have to let people have a voice. Um, if we silence people, if we shut them down, that kind of disrespectful behavior completely shuts down the debate environment. And our option, our opportunities for getting at the truth just go and take a huge nosedive right after that. Um, we're headed straight into dogmatism and closed-mindedness at that point. Um, so that's a very important part of uh, the of cashing out respect is giving people a voice and protecting their space and letting them have that that space and have that voice. Um, but sometimes I think we're afraid that criticism is a way of shutting people down or silencing them. Sometimes we experience it ourselves, and when we get criticized, then we're like, oh, and we get quiet. But I think we can't do that in this class, not if we're doing truth-seeking. And what we need to do is find a way for criticism to be done respectfully. And the quick idea here that I have is that it can be totally respectful to say, I think you're absolutely wrong about this, and here are all the reasons why I think you're wrong. And I still respect you. Part of it can be like, if I give a kind of critical response like that to someone, at least I'm showing I'm taking their ideas seriously. It's so easy to just say, oh, agree to disagree. Or I'm like, cool, thanks for sharing your perspective. And privately, I'm like, I could never believe that. I think that's bullshit. I've never, I'm not on that side. But you do you. That's cool. But I don't think that we can do that if we're being authentic truth seekers here. Um, we do have to go to the deeper level of respect of trying on other people's perspectives for ourselves. Because maybe they're better than our ideas. Um, and if we find out that we, we have concerns about that, that maybe we can't switch positions, sharing those criticisms is a gift. It can be a way of caring too. Um, kind of like an intervention on a friend who you think is making like very destructive life choices. You're like, dude, I respect you, I love you, but man, I, it would not be caring if I just didn't say anything about this. Like I see what's going on and I'm worried about you. Like that kind of intervention, we'd say, is a caring behavior. We can do that with each other. It doesn't. It's not necessarily at high stakes if we're having a philosophical debate about something. But you know, you would think for yourself, it'd be better if you had true beliefs rather than false ones. So if you care about other people, you think wouldn't that be good for them to have true beliefs instead of false ones too? I think I, I would say yeah. Um, so if you're noticing a possible problem or objection to a person's perspective and you offer that to them, that's a gift if they sincerely care about the truth. They can, and, and you do things in the right way to set up the relational space for that to be the way in which criticism is received, then I think it can have that kind of benefit. I think open disagreement and criticism can be caring, can be respectful. All these things are possible. But that's not to say that it's easy to make that. And it's definitely not the case that every time someone criticizes you, they're respecting you and caring about you, because that's absurd. That's not the case, right? There's lots of ways to do criticism in ways that are not caring and not respectful. So it takes care to create a space where critical debate can be done that way. And that's what the principles on the code are also about. And that's what the code is holding itself accountable to. Like it says here, it's wanting to be the rules that, when followed, constrain our behavior within context of disagreement in light of what we owe to others and to ourselves. You can disrespect yourself, too, by silencing yourself. That's one w way to do it, um, by not respecting your own right to have a perspective and to share it um, and to, to participate in that vulnerable space um, that is a, can be a special gift. 
and a benefit to us. There's also some things to say about the procedural stuff um, that I want to get into. I mentioned really briefly, way, way back at the beginning of the video, um, when Alejandro, you asked that question, um, that there is kind of like, we'd like to get at the truth, but maybe that's not possible. So we go to kind of the next best thing, um, figuring out which position is the most rationally defensible. So we want the code to have rules that give us the best shot of doing that. Um, there actually is a third one that's on that list, uh, and it's kind of like successful resolution of issues. So it's kind of like if we can't get to an agreement rationally about which position has the most going for it, what then? Right? What 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 happens then? And and this is where I think sometimes we get tempted into thinking there are different rules, right? That um, there's this kind of ivory tower of truth seeking. But then there's kind of this pragmatic thing that most of life is in the mud and uh, doesn't play by the same rules as this sort of sincere truth seeker sort of thing. So how we're going to resolve disagreements start, you know, being more practical and compromising on concerns about the truth. And I think what the code is saying is that the rules don't change. If you can't agree, can't get rational consensus on which perspective or which answer to a question is the one with the best justification currently best evidence for it, then you still have to follow the same rules for figuring out what are you going to do about that disagreement? How are you going to respond to that? Are you going to take the route of agree to disagree? Maybe in some circumstances that is an appropriate response, but I can definitely imagine circumstances in which it's not. Um, if any of you uh, know your 20th century history, um, you know uh, Peace in Our Time, Chamberlain, the Munich Pact, Ring Any Bells? Famous photo of him coming back to London with this waving this piece of paper in the air. This is uh, Chamberlain, the Prime Minister of, of Britain at the time, uh, making an agreement with Hitler prior to World War II. It was basically like, okay, Hitler we did, 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 did some things that we didn't want to have happen. You know, there was some rules about after World War One about things they shouldn't be doing. They're doing those things, but and war is we're on the brink of war. But he goes to Berlin, talks with Hitler, and they're like. Okay, we can deal with this. We'll let you keep doing your thing, and we'll do our thing. We'll agree to disagree. We're not going to get into a big fight, and that didn't go so well. So maybe when I know it's always a low-hanging fruit to bring up the Nazis, so forgive me for that. But you know, agreeing to disagree with Nazis is probably not the right option. There's something else that's going to have to happen here for how we're going to deal with our disagreement, or to use something that's maybe not as loaded as the Nazis. Um, Think about a roommate. If you, any of you have ever uh, lived with a roommate um, or in a family, stuff like that, uh, where people have different levels of cleanliness, and you have different perspectives and values about that, um, agree to disagree doesn't always work out very well, right? Each person does their own thing and you step on, to on each other's toes all the time. It might mean, mean that you're going to have to negotiate some way of dealing with that disagreement um, given that you can't resolve it. Uh, you, one of you is not going to convince the other necessarily about what standards of cleanliness are appropriate or ideal. Um, but maybe you can find some other way of dealing with the fact that you disagree. And that's going to require the same kind of open critical debate um, that the truth seeking itself would require. That's what the code is saying there in the procedural standard. And I think that's kind of interesting. Um, if the code's able to deliver on that, that's kind of a big, big promise. Um, the rules don't change whether we can get what we hope for or not. Whether skepticism uh, is something we're not able to avoid, maybe there's still some things left for us to do. And that's kind of the message of Falk's paper, too, that the process of reasoning is still justified, even if it doesn't get us what we hope it will. Um, okay, so let's keep moving here. Any any kind of, from people in the chat, any questions up to this point in tonight's lecture? Anything you want to ask about? I'm very self-conscious about how much I'm blabbing <laughs> with very little interruptions. Um have things been going well? Making sense? Thumbs up? Cool. Um, not seeing any text. Thumbs up. Thanks. Cool. Thanks, Kimberly. Um, okay, so the, the, the rest of the principles on the code... Um, there's 12 of them, and they're kind of divided up into uh, three sections. Um, there's some principles about giving us advice about when we're coming to the table of debate, 
uh, how we should do that. Uh, I, I like this metaphor, the table. There's like this table that I, I have all these ideas and I, I play cards on the table, like these different ideas and arguments and things. Uh, and you're playing cards and we're having this kind of conversation, this kind of debate table um, is sort of the space of the debate. Uh, so the, the first couple principles are about like what should be our attitude going into this whole thing. Then there's a bunch of principles, about eight of them, that are about what we do in the middle of the debate, just the behavior that we're going to exhibit there. And then uh, a couple principles for how, how do we dismount from this discussion. How do we go from here? So the debate's over. Now what? Right? Um, where are we going to go next? Um, and let's start with the first couple that are about um, the sort of attitude that we go into things with. So this is the fallibility principle and the truth-seeking principle. And I want to talk first about the truth-seeking principle. If there's a principle on this code that's sort of like the heart of the code, I'd say this is it. Um, that uh, and, and with a little adjustment that I'd want to make to it. But uh, here, I'll bring up that again. Um, the truth-seeking principle says, each participant should be committed to the task of earnestly searching for the truth, or at least the most defensible position on the issue at stake. Therefore, one should be willing to examine alternative positions seriously, look for insights in the positions of others, and allow other participants to present arguments of or raise objections to any position held on an issue. Now, first little adjustment, I'd, well, well, okay, actually, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, what this principle is kind of saying in summary is that if... You know, we talked about truth as one of the goals of the code itself. So it's kind of like saying, hey, if we're having this debate because we want to find the truth, then you know what's going to set us up for success? If everyone in the debate has that as their priority, if they have that as their goal, then that's going to give us the best chance of actually meeting that goal, which is pretty no-brainer. Um, and the one major adjustment I'd want to make here, or I guess minor, it's not that big of a change, uh, would be to just add the same thing for the ethical um, standard for the code. So I'm about to sneeze. Mm. Whew. I think I'm okay. All right. So if we also care about treating each other ethically, then I think it would be good to say, hey, uh, everyone who's going to engage in the debate should have treating each other respectfully as a priority as well. So that seems like a no-brainer. Um, but there's something uh, a little deeper here about this principle that may not read right off the page. Um, the way Edward has worded the principle is that it's talking positively. It's saying everyone should care about the truth if we're going to have the debate. And I don't find that that's usually a problem. Um, I don't know many people who are like, don't give a shit about the truth. I'm just here to screw around, right? Like trolls or something on the internet. Um, we don't really advertise that. And all of us tend to think that like, yeah, I care about the truth. I value the truth. Yes, I'm a good person in that way. Um, I don't care. I don't like lies, ignorance, and bullshit. I'm all about the truth. So it's a pretty easy thing to say that you care about the truth. The problem, and what this principle is really combating, is all the other stuff that we care about that's not the truth, or ethics, right? Um, things that aren't in those two categories, like my ego. Now, um, I, so I really think a, a great way that maybe this could be reworded is to say... Um, Everyone, every participant in the debate should be concerned with seeking the truth instead of other things, other ulterior motives, um, that those should not be on the table. That the more that you've got these other kinds of ulterior motives, the more that's going to distract from our truth-seeking efforts. And that's the concern. Um, so, uh, woof. That thing doesn't want to go away. Sorry. Um... So what are some of those things? Well, there's some really obvious ones. Like, um, if my purpose in a debate is to show off my intellectual muscles or to basically um, enact my arrogance or narcissism or something, then that's going to be a real problem. I mean, try to have a debate with a narcissist. It's it's impossible to get through to them, right? Um, it can be a re very, very frustrating conversation. Um, those things really distract from truth-seeking. But I think there's a lot of, and, and people being manipulative or all sorts of other things that are obviously inappropriate, but I think some of the most pernicious ones are the ones that we might have a lot more sympathy and compassion for, especially uh, this desire to not be shamed, uh, to save face, to 
survive the debate with my skin intact to basically not get totally destroyed. Um, and that's uh, that also can be just as destructive for destroying our efforts at uh, truth-seeking as someone who's really arrogant. Um, so that that's something to keep in mind too. But everything revolves around that. The sincerity of purpose is really important. Now, another thing about these first two principles, the truth-seeking and fallibility principle, is that they're all about attitude. And attitude is really hard to judge. Um, not only for other people, but even for ourselves. Maybe especially for ourselves. It's really hard to get a sense of that. Um, my baby is waking up uh, and fussing a little bit. Let me run up there really quickly and check in on them, and I'll be right back. I'll pause the video here. Uh, sorry about this. Maybe this is a good time for a break anyway. We've been talking for over an hour. Uh, so I'll be right back as soon as I can. So, all right. Sorry about that. Um, just a minor little thing. Hopefully he'll stay down. Um, what was I? Oh, right. So we're talking about attitude here with these things, so like sincerity. Um, and there's some some ideas I want to share about this too. Um, one, it's really hard to judge these things. And I think it's... So this is a little bit more of my kind of personal advice in context of disagreement and debate. I think it's it's wise to um, really hesitate on pulling the trigger on an accusation of insincerity, um, especially openly to another person. Because for one thing, if there's already kind of something motivating them to not be fully sincere or authentic in their participating in the truth-seeking thing, chances are like a direct confrontation with them, like calling them out on the carpet, is going to just make that way worse. Um, so maybe sometimes it's right, I think, to to kind of take a pause and kind of reorient about things and kind of step away from the debate for a time being to kind of figure out what else is going on um, and then maybe return back to that. I always think uh, it, this is definitely much more kind of my style of doing things, but recognizing that anything good that's going to come out of this debate is something you and the other person are going to do together. It's a relational thing, um, it's a human thing, and making sure that's solid first. Um, in my experience, uh, sort of probably nine times out of ten, when a debate goes from being productive, healthy, and respectful to being unproductive, destructive, and abusive, is usually right at that point, like you can, you saw the graph of like going good, 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 and then in the shitter. Uh, it's usually right at that point that one party or the other, um, correctly or incorrectly, believes the other person to be insincere. So they could even be wrong about it, right? They could have a maybe a misunderstanding. But when that trust starts to crumble, then a lot of other stuff follows right after that. And, and sort of the, the really abusive argumentative practice, practices become more attractive and viable. And they're, the kind of defense mechanisms that people have start showing up. So I think it, it's always you, it's good to be really careful about uh, accusing another person of insincerity. Or maybe if they've got these kind of ulterior motives going on, finding some other way to kind of be diplomatic about it rather than just being like, I think you're full of shit kind of thing. You know, like, that's not going to really do a lot of good, probably. Uh, if the debate was at all struggling, that'll probably be the death knell of it in terms of going down at that point. Um, but there, sometimes it's like, uh, when I, I like to have philosophical debates with everyone. Um, my partner uh, would not be married to me if they weren't um, concerned, or they, they weren't cool with that. Um, but I know that sometimes there's there's choices to make here. So, at, when we're having a certain discussion, you know, if I can tell there's something else going on um, with friend, family, partner, whoever I'm talking to, I sometimes I'm just like, hey, so like, how how are you doing with this discussion right now? Like, where are you at? It's like, what's going on? Is there anything bothering you? This kind of thing. Um, sometimes taking that little time out helps a lot, and that's a more productive way to do things. Um, but there's a lot of advice I can give, and, and we could go for a long time talking about how to do this stuff. But the, the general point here is that as much as possible, whatever way we're going to be savvy about this, um, having eye on the prize uh, with truth, uh, truth seeking as our priority and the ethical component as our priority, that's going to give us the best chance of actually accomplishing those things. And there's a lot of other stuff that can distract from that, um, especially when we're talking about business ethics. Holy cow, there's a lot of other things that might be a priority above 
figuring out what is ethically the best thing to do. One of the very common patterns, I think I talked about this in the video yesterday, um, one of the very common patterns and thoughts about business ethics is people wanting to have their cake and eat it too. I want to be a profitable company and be ethical. And usually if you're trying to make both of those things happen to the utmost, guess which one gets thrown under the bus a little bit. Right? We might tell our ourselves um, some comfortable lies uh, about what we what we really believe that is what's ethical. You know, nothing more is asked of us than this. We're already doing more than is required of us kind of thing. Um, maybe short selling our moral obligations to try to make room for profit because uh, that motive is strongly present in the business world. Let's put it that way. Um, there'll be a ubiquitous element here in our discussions. And then we've got the fallibility principle. And uh, this is also kind of on the level of attitude. And I think if I'd asked all of you to to write your own code of intellectual conduct prior to looking at this, this one would probably be first thing on the list. That'd be my guess for, for most of us. Um, fallibility principle is basically saying be open-minded. Don't be closed-minded. If you're going to have a, a debate, an open debate, try to seek the truth, you got to be willing to listen to other ideas. You have to acknowledge that your own initial position coming to the table of the debate at the beginning may not be the one that you're supposed to leave the debate with. It might not turn out to be the most defensible position on this issue. So you will you have to be open to that. You have to be willing to look at things from other perspectives, perspectives that are going to say you're wrong, uh, that disagree with you. Um, and I think that's kind of something we'd always want out of someone that we're having a conversation with. We want out of ourselves um, something we would want. Uh, maybe our egos don't like that so much. There's other attachments we have that can make that problematic. But, um, you know, looked at on paper in a vacuum, this is what we'd want for other people and for ourselves. And, and so I don't think there's anything like too controversial about the fallibility principle. But what I do think does get into some uh, dicier territory is... What does it mean to be open-minded? What does it mean to avoid dogmatic attitudes? What does that actually require of us? And that I have a lot of opinions about. So maybe I'll turn this whole thing around again. Um, I have some strong strong opinions about this one. Uh, gosh, I'll try to do this quickly. Um, I hope no one's getting too bored with how slowly I'm working through this material. Um, but there's just so much to talk about, in my opinion. Uh, okay, I'll try to make this snappy. I think for most of us, we want to figure out, we're very concerned about whether people are open-minded or closed-minded going into a debate. And uh, we want to avoid discussions with closed-minded people because those don't usually end up very fun, right? They're, they can get nasty quick and, you know, it's like why there's certain topics you're not supposed to bring up at the family Thanksgiving dinner kind of thing, right? Um, can get into that territory. So we want to know, it's something we're, I think, largely tracking. We want to make sure that the people we're talking with are open-minded instead of closed-minded. Uh, it's, a, it's a big concern on the radar. So we want, to make, we want to figure that out as soon as possible, which means we look at our evidence to people's behavior at the beginning of the debate, not in the middle of it, not after we've already kind of opened up those cans of worms, but early on. And so what kind of evidence do you have early on in a discussion? You basically have people's um, attitude, their rhetoric, their posturing, and that's about it. And I think we tend to associate open-mindedness with people who are like, ooh, I'm not so sure what I think, you know, like I can see it this way, that way, this way, this way, I don't know, you know, there's a lot of people with different experiences than me, uh, not everyone thinks about things the way I do, but you know, I kind of think like maybe this, right? All these caveats um, before kind of sharing their perspective, and we're like, oh, this person isn't, doesn't have a lot of confidence in their position, so they must be open-minded. Or if they're on the fence, then that means that they're open-minded. Um, and someone who's posturing with a lot of confidence is like, you know what, I think this is what's objectively true. And here's my reasons for it, this kind of thing. Someone who's posturing that strong, I think we have a tendency to consider as closed-minded. If they have very strong opinions, um, that we might assume that they're closed-minded. I, I don't think we always do this, but it's just a tendency I've noticed. Um, and I think that's looking in the wrong spot. Uh, for one thing, uh, having a lack of conviction or confidence does not mean that you're open-minded. Um, sometimes, if, if we're talking about uh, open-minded, closed-minded, in terms of like fallibility, like a willingness to engage with criticism um, and opposing perspectives, I've found uh, that many times it's the people that have the least confidence that are the most dogmatic. 
And that kind of gets us in the territory of this position called relativism. Uh, relativism believes, uh, if we're talking about moral relativism, let's say, we'll talk about this more on Thursday. Um, moral relativism holds that there isn't objective universal moral truth. Every person, if you're an individualist relativist, or uh, every culture, if you're a cultural relativist, uh, has their own truth for them. And it's not the same for other people. Um, and that kind of relativism uh, it defines truth in terms of just what people believe. Uh, one of the fallouts from this, this is what we'll, we'll explore a lot more on Thursday, is that if relativism is right, if there's no objective truth and there's just people's individual truths for themselves based on what they believe, then it's impossible for you to ever be wrong. There's no accountability. You're always right with whatever you believe. If your truth is determined by your belief, you can't make the wrong choice. It'll just be whatever you do believe. So that means not a willingness to engage with criticism at all, because there's no way in which you're wrong. You're, it's like you're a god of your own universe that you're creating for yourself. There's no accountability that you're subject to. But that's definitely someone who's going to hesitate on trying to say anything about other people's truths, if, they're, if they have that kind of moral relativism position. If that's raising some questions for you, hang on to that. We'll, we can talk about that on Thursday. Uh, or send me an email. Um, definitely, I'll, if, if I get any sort of comments or questions or things, I'll try to build them into my lecture on Thursday when we talk about that a little bit more. Um, but that's an example of how someone could have very little conviction in terms of making judgments universally and yet be very, very dogmatic and closed-minded, unwillingness to entertain criticism. You might uh, be familiar with this with phrases like, you don't know me, right? You don't know my truth. Who are you to say that I'm, that I'm wrong about this? Those kinds of reactions, definitely dogmatic, right? But it doesn't necessarily mean that this person thinks that they know the answers for everybody else, right? They're just like, don't want the criticism. Okay, so that's an option. That's the thing that can happen. Um, also, someone can have a lot of conviction and be open-minded in the sense of willingness to entertain the possibility that they're wrong. If they're just saying, here's all the ideas that I, I'm bringing to the table about why, when I've thought about this in the past, I've been kind of convinced that this is the best answer. This is the thing I think it's got the most going for it because of all these reasons. Um, but maybe I'm wrong. Tell me what you think about that. Do you see any opportunities for criticism here by right, inviting that? Um, they're definitely doing what the fallibility principle is asking for, even if they have a lot of confidence and conviction. Be like, if I'm having a debate with a Nazi, you know, sorry to bring up the Nazis again, it's too easy. But, you know, just as an example, if I'm having a debate with a Nazi, I don't think they're probably going to convince me um, that Arianism is right or something, right? Or that the Holocaust was not a mistake, a huge moral tragedy. I don't think they're going to convince me of that. All I need to do, though, in order to be open-minded, is to be willing to entertain their arguments and see what they have to offer. It doesn't mean I have to agree with them. It just means I have to be willing to look at that and be like, well, maybe I'm wrong about this, but let's explore that. Just the possibility of being wrong doesn't mean I'm wrong. right? It's just the fallibility principle is about a willingness to engage, which is why I think, and so hat's still turned here, um, the best policy about how to track the fallibility principle for yourself and for other people is that you can't really tell until the rubber hits the road. It's not until you're knee deep in the debate um, and the criticisms are starting to fly that you'll see whether people are actually open-minded or whether they're closed-minded. The proof will be in the pudding. When the objections are showing up, how do they respond to them? Do they dismiss them, sweep them under the rug, distract attention, you know, find excuses, rationalize, or when they get criticism, are they like, oh, thank you for this. I've been looking for some criticism. Let's see what we got here. How does this weigh? Does this, uh, does this look? And they're taking it seriously, trying to evaluate it. If you're a sincere true seeker, I, I mentioned earlier, your opponent's your best friend. You want to test your ideas. You're like, I don't know if my ideas are right. I want to meet with some resistance on it and see whether it can hold up to criticism or not. So when someone actually does give you the criticism and you have that sincere attitude, then the, the sincere truth seeker will be like, thank you, yes, I've been waiting for this. And their ego might be like, oh. But, you know, if they're sincere, they're like, my values are on valuing criticism, um, opportunities for objection, helping me see what I might be missing, um, looking at it from a different perspective that maybe I haven't entertained before. We'd be excited about that. Now, that's a hard ask. Like, we're human, all too human. Um, but uh, that that is... Sort of the ideal here. That's the ideal attitude if we can make it happen. Um, so I think uh, it's, again, wise to not go to snap judgments about whether people are open-minded or closed-minded, sincere, insincere. You kind of need to give them 
some some rope and, and see what they do with it. And that is risky and that's hard. And I totally sympathize with that. I mean there's there's many times where I've been like, do I want to give this person the opportunity um, to you know, am I gonna go there with someone? Um, and so I, I I don't think that the answer is you always have to say yes and you always have to put yourself in that position. There's definitely times where there's something else at stake here that might override that, in my opinion. Um, but when it comes to the the sort of ideal here for how a debate should go, that's what we'd hope for. If we can make that happen, if that's something he, that the people in the debate can create, if they can create that space of goodwill uh, and sincerity, then that's the dream. Sometimes other things get in the way of that. So it's kind of an all things equal, this is best. But there might be some overriding concerns there too. Okay, so that's the first couple principles on the code. Now another 10 more to go, right? Um, let's, uh, let's not do all of them. Um, I'll, I'll try to get some highlights here because uh, we're coming up on about an hour and a half. Um, okay, this is, okay, let, let, let's do this a little bit. So one really cool thing here, fallibility truth-seeking principle I think, like I said, truth-seeking principle is the heart of the code. And when we do this paradigm shift from competition to cooperation, so many things get changed. And uh, and sometimes things in, um, in, in kind of deeper ways. And I think a really good illustration of that is the clarity principle. So the clarity principle says, the formulations of all positions, defenses, and attacks should be free of any kind of linguistic confusion and clearly separated from other positions or issues. It's just saying like big clear, like a debate is a communication activity, so communicate effectively. Um, something that's not a, probably a big surprise, um, but I think there's a deeper meaning here to the clarity principle. So, you know, if we were having any kind of conversation, clarity would be a value. But if our goal here is sincere truth-seeking and we want to test our ideas and see what they're, what they're actually worth, and we, you know, acknowledge our fallibility. Ooh, pardon me. Then another reason why I want to be clear is so that in the conversation, we can spend as little time as we can get away with just understanding what I'm saying, in order to leave maximum time left over for figuring out whether what I'm saying makes any sense or not. And you might have observed this from politicians. Politicians use this strategy all the time of being intentionally confusing and unclear so that they can't be held critically accountable for what they're saying or to distract attention from it or to use up time and space without really saying anything meaningful that they can be held to. The whole point of being a sincere truth seeker is to put my ideas out there and make them as vulnerable as possible. I want to make it as easy as possible for you to attack my position. Not that I'm going to create intentionally weak positions, but that I'm going to try to really lay it all out there so there's no question about what I'm saying. And if there are any problems with it, you won't have to wrestle with the clarity thing. You can just focus all of your intellectual efforts on evaluating whether what I'm saying uh, makes sense or not. So that's the kind of hidden meaning here of the clarity principle in light of this sort of cooperative, sincere, truth-seeking sort of thing that we're trying to do. Um, is that making sense for those of you in the chat? You're my you're my little barometer for the YouTubers for later. How's this going? Does that include cultural differences? Are you talking about uh, clarity? Yes. Yes, yeah. So uh, an important thing about how I'm describing the clarity principle is that the point is to try to shrink the amount of time we have to spend on understanding what I'm saying as small as possible. So the as possible thing is pretty big there. The point is not you have to say everything in a sound bite or a tweet, <laughs> but that we want to, you don't want to, you want to do everything in your power to be able to get that the ideas across, to communicate those ideas as effectively as you can. Um, and that means knowing your audience, too. So if they're not savvy on some of the cultural stuff that's a part of where your perspective is coming from, 
bring them up to speed with that. It's something you might have to do, especially in philosophy. Some of the stuff that we're trying to understand is just hard. It's just really complicated. I mean, we're going to spend so many hours this quarter uh, just talking through stuff and trying to make sense of what is being said. Um, and it's not it, the fact that it takes so much effort doesn't mean these people aren't doing a good job on clarity. It might just mean that the subject matter they're trying to talk about is just difficult. And that can definitely happen when you're talking about two people in a conversation that are coming from different cultural backgrounds. Um, it's kind of like, uh, I mean, that's explicitly what's happening in this class. Being a part of professional philosophy is definitely its own type of culture. And there's its own like world and language and all these ideas and terminology that are part of my background assumptions and part of my what I bring to the table in a conversation. And if you're taking philosophy for the first time or the second time, um, you might not be uh, enculturated into all of that stuff. You know, and so I got to find some way to kind of bridge the gap on that and try to help you bring on board with the stuff I want to share. And if you've got some kind of cultural differences that are going on for where you're approaching the ideas that we're exploring in these readings and in the lectures, to communicate that to me and know where you're coming from helps me communicate and explain these ideas to you too. So um, I think that's a, a shared responsibility and definitely um, the cultural thing can be a complication. Uh, and that's just part of the territory. It's something that the clarity principle though is saying you have to address that stuff. If there's something that's going to create confusion, you want to clear that up um, so that you do have, uh, you're in a position to be able to evaluate the merits of an argument uh, fairly and accurately. Like if I don't understand an idea, then I definitely can't evaluate it, right? My evaluation, whatever judgment I make of it, is basically worthless if I didn't really understand it or if I'm misunderstanding it. Cool. Um, cultural differences are going to be uh, definitely a thing um, that's going to come up again in this class. Like, it will, it will definitely come up with the relativism thing. It will definitely come up with our section on international business. Um, but it's kind of, it's just looming everywhere with ethics because one of the big things that makes cultures distinct from each other are what values they have and what they see as a vision for ethical living. And as we want to pursue the truth about this stuff, we have to look at all those options. We can't just presuppose the sorts of values that we find intuitive or that our conscience is responsive to, because very often those things are deeply influenced by the culture that we're a part of. Um, and we have to hold those things accountable. And that's where um, you know, getting some exposure to other cultures can be really philosophically enriching to help you kind of push past those boundaries of the things you take for granted as assumptions um, and helps with this project of critical accountability for our beliefs. Absolutely. Um, there's another side of that story too, but we'll talk about the relativism on Thursday. Um, so the, the clarity principle is kind of a good paradigmatic example about how a lot of other principles are on the code. They're on there because of the truth-seeking principle. Now there is another one that I definitely want to highlight, uh, certainly by the end of tonight, and it's the principle of charity. And it's actually the sort of flip side of the burden of proof principle. So I'll sort of talk about these together. But of all the principles on the code, this one is far and away the one I consider to be the most significant, the most important to talk about. If the true seeking principle I described as the heart of the code, the principle of charity is the soul of the code. I mean, it's the thing that is what it's all about. It's like everything about the different sort of model of what critical debate can look like that the code is presenting just gets like, it's just like all wrapped up in the principle of charity. And the reason I think this is that charity is, if you're operating competitively in a debate, that's the last thing you're going to do. Um, there are ways that you could make a show of charity as a way to try to win or leverage something over your opponent rhetorically or something like that. So there's ways you could, there's definitely ways around this, but for it takes pretty sneaky behavior techniques to make, to pull that off. Um, in general, if you just want to win, charity is the last thing you're going to do. And if you're interested in cooperative truth, sincere truth seeking, then it's the first thing on your radar of things you want to do. So in many ways, if you're trying to figure out, is my partner sincere or not? Do they acknowledge the fallibility principle or not? Um, if they're demonstrating charity, that's one of the clearest signals that they're, uh, they're legit. <laughs> They've got the right attitude here. Um, 
because uh, it's usually something that will be avoided by someone who is not operating w with the idea of sincerely exploring the truth, um, but just wants to win a debate. What is charity, though? Um, I don't quite like the formulation that Edward Damer has in the Code of Intellectual Conduct. Um, he describes something that's sort of uh, a little bit of the letter of the law, not quite the spirit of the law. But the basic idea, and I think what charity demands from us is greater than what he sort of lists as the obligation there in that principle. Um, basically, charity is this. Um, normally, in a debate, we spend a lot of time thinking about what arguments we want to use to defend our own position. Charity means coming up with arguments to support your opponent's position. So that means either uh, interpreting what they're saying in the strongest possible light, avoiding straw manning them, avoiding uh, twisting their position to make it easier to attack, like reducing them to something absurd or something like that. Um, that's not a reductio ad absurdum. That's a different thing if you've ever heard of that argument pattern before in logic. Reductio ad absurdum. That's not what I'm talking about here. But the kind of distorting of someone's position to make it easier to attack is what is the mistake of straw man argumentation. So charity is the antidote to that. It's saying don't do that. Interpret them in the best possible light. Um, and I think go a little further. In the course of the debate, if you think up of a, a good argument kind of spontaneously for your opponent or an objection they could make to your position, share it. Don't sweep that under the rug. If you think of it, you kind of have an obligation to share that. Anything else would be insincere. That's one thing. Another thing would be um, if we spend so much time trying to rationalize and justify our own perspectives, maybe we should devote some of our mental bandwidth for trying to think about things from the other side. So kind of uh, rational empathy is kind of what charity is. Trying to get inside the head of your opponent. Why would their position not just be something I could be motivated to believe, but why might it actually be justified? Why would it make sense? Not just how could I maybe... B, how could I see it as making sense? Like the way that I can kind of imagine how, well, if I had a different kind of upbringing, maybe I'd see that I wouldn't see a problem with racism, right? That's not charity. Charity would be more like, what legitimate arguments could someone use to defend uh, racism for reals? That's a lot harder to do, right? It's a lot easier to come up with motivations for people. Or, yeah, I could see how someone would be tricked into holding this false belief. I, I can understand that. That's not... that. Charity is something a lot deeper. It means trying to put your opponent on their best possible footing. The most potentially legitimate things for them to say. Again, it doesn't have to be something you actually agree with. And... Usually the follow-up for charity, if we go a little further down the code of intellectual conduct here, um, there's another principle called the rebuttal principle, which is telling you that you have to anticipate criticisms of your position and respond to them. So usually what happens is charity, rebuttal, right? So I, I try to build up my opponent as strong as possible and then go after them. I mean, share my reasons for thinking why they're wrong. So I might, um, man, it's so hard to defend racism. I, I should have chosen a better illustration. <laughs> But try to like, uh, oh, um, maybe, uh, uh, I don't want to do something absurd. Um, let me do something a little more sincere. So I, I'm, um, I'm religious, and I'm very much aware, and I love talking about uh, arguments around whether it's rational to have religious faith or not. Um, and not in some kind of like rationalizing excuse thing. Like very much in terms of charity. I really, I, I can understand... Um, legitimate reasons why someone would think uh, having religious faith or belief is not the right choice and in fact might be an unethical choice, that it would be the absolute wrong thing to do. Um, I can try to get inside my opponent's head and be like, what might be motivating that in the in sense of rational motivation? What might be an argument, a potentially legitimate argument, that would pose a threat to that conclusion? And then I can think up those things and still be like, I don't think that they're effective. I think those concerns are not fatal enough, or there's ways to respond to those concerns that deal with them, that resolve those concerns without giving up on the idea of religious faith. Um, I'm not going to start proselytizing on you, don't worry. But um, that's I think that would be a more sincere example for me to choose. Um, uh, 
<laughs> uh, sometimes it matters why we believe what we believe, right? And not just what we believe. And, and uh, I, I have an, a story, an anecdotal story from grad school about this. I was uh, hanging out in this cafe that was next to my house, um, type making, dry, uh, drinking coffee, writing philosophy papers late night. It was a good spot for that. Uh, but it was kind of like the most icely cantina of Kalamazoo, Michigan, which is where I was living. Uh, a lot of real characters in there, and people would strike up philosophical conversations like all the time. It was awesome, whether they were in college or not. Uh, studying philosophy or not, I'd, I'd have all sorts of conversations. And one night I was having a conversation about uh, faith and and belief in God and whether that's rational or not. And my friend I was talking with was atheistic. Um, and then this other guy was kind of overhearing the conversation and then he wanted to jump in. And he was like, yeah, pointing to me, he was like, you should listen to what this guy is saying because like, faith is really important and for all these reasons. And all the reasons he offered, I was just like, oh man, I think those are terrible arguments. And in that moment, I was like, I kind of feel like I'm more on the side of my atheist friend than on this guy who's supposedly having the same conclusion that I do. Um, so the, the how we get to our conclusions can matter as much as what we believe. Uh, sometimes more, I'd say. Um, and the kind of the principle about charity is sort of reflecting that too in its own way. Because it's like, it's not just enough that I want to be convinced that my side is right and that I'm able to defeat this opponent. Like I've got an argument against this position. But I want to make sure that I'm really giving it the best run for its money. Um, that if it's wrong, I really am. I've done everything that's my due diligence in terms of entertaining it, and not I, I'm not kind of looking at some watered down version, or I've missed something big that they can use to try to justify their position. It, it's kind of a more complete analysis if I do that. Um, but it's also a big gesture of goodwill. I mean, just think about it. If you're in a debate with someone, you're in a, a, a discussion exploring a disagreement, and you offer to them some weapons that they can use against you, I mean, that's a really powerful gesture of sincerity, I think. And it's, it's one of my best pieces of advice if you're trying to have a debate with someone and you can tell that they're kind of like, you know, nervous about getting into a risky debate about something that like is pretty sticky and messy, like ethics or something, um, that if you kind of open early on with with trying to give them some things about like here's where here's what I'm thinking about the position that you have here's what I've heard in the past that sounded you know the most convincing to me these look like the best arguments what do you think about those um, doing that kind of invitation is like a big olive branch it's like stepping out of your trench and walking into no man's land like World War one style where you're just like wide open here like and once we once we let down our, our defensive barriers, then then sometimes some pretty magical things can happen. So I think it's good to kind of take the first step on that um, and make that gesture to somebody else and invite them into that space too. Um, so many times I've found uh, a lot of us are tempted into doing competitive stuff and, and kind of bullshit argumentative practices like straw man or ad hominem attacks, all that kind of stuff, abusive behavior, yelling matches, um, just because we're really afraid. Um, it's 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 a vulnerable space to be in to be in the space of critical accountability with another person. It's very intimate, I think, uh, if done sincerely. And um, if you can kind of give someone an indication, like send strong signals that you're not playing by those rules. You're playing by these different rules. You want to do this cooperative, sincere, truth-seeking thing with them. You're not here to destroy them and shoot them down and stuff like that. Um, I've I've seen I've had a lot of success with people. Uh, operating sincerely too, um, kind of seeing that and you're like, oh, you're not going to abuse me in five seconds. I don't have to be afraid of that. Then a lot of those other practices start to fall away. That's another reason why I think giving respect as a premise instead of as a conclusion uh, is the right idea. Not like all those interviews with athletes where they're like, respect has to be earned. I'm like, not, not, not this kind of respect. Maybe in a the competitive world of a professional basketball or something, then that makes sense. Uh, and I love sports too, by the way. But um, uh, certainly for something like um, true seeking, this is this is it's a different game. So uh, I mentioned charity is kind of uh, one side of a coin. The other side of the coin is the burden of proof principle, and and this one's kind of like saying, if you want to put something on the table of the debate, if you want to make a contribution to a debate. It's your job to justify that claim, or that position, or that argument, 
not your opponent's job to show why it's wrong. Like the burden of proof is on the person who makes the claim, not on the other person. So to kind of like burden of proof charity, it's like burden of proof is saying take responsibility for your own shit, like back up your own claims. Um, and charity is like take responsibility for the other person's shit too. Like try to come up with arguments for both sides. Um, that's That's something that would be good to do. I think a lot of times, maybe this is just kind of from like English paper practices or things like that. When I get student papers in my philosophy classes, sometimes I feel like students feel like they have to put in arguments from both sides as kind of a perfunctory thing or to like show to prove that they're open-minded or something like that. But, and, and that's all well and good. I mean, to just do it to do it is not worthless. But um, really the, the deeper reasons for why we want to do these things um, are kind of a little different. So charity, it's because you want to face off against the strongest possible opponents to test your ideas against, or you don't really know what they're worth. Um, the whole idea of the, the name straw man attack is because if I'm beating, if I'm besting in combat a scarecrow, it's not a big achievement for me. Scarecrow can't fight back. Right? They can't do anything. There's no threat. Me to hack them down is like, doesn't prove anything. If I face off against a stronger position, though, and I'm able to defeat that, then I've accomplished something a little bit more significant. We tested the idea, it holds a little bit more water. Again, you're not trying to slay opponents here or something like that. Um, it's like you and your conversational partner working to do this project together. But, um, but there's still, you want to have the ideas face off and face off against opportunity for stiff resistance. Now, when it comes to burden of proof, there's a little different bit of a spirit behind why it's important to take responsibility for your own claims. Uh, my favorite way to kind of cashing, cashing this one out is um, to kind of speak to uh, some of our social conventions, like in our culture. Um, when you're with a group of people, uh, like say a group of friends, and someone says something, it's kind of like claims are accepted until they get challenged, right? Like people are like, yeah, man, totally. There's like, oh, there's this kind of like social momentum to agree. And if someone disagrees, you might be like, oh, they just don't, I, don't, I don't agree with that. Do I want to raise a stink about this or not? Like you have this little internal monologue, right? Am I going to Am I gonna be like, hey, man, I actually disagree with that? Because then everyone, what happens in the social setting? <sighs> All the attention goes to you, right? The person who's rocking the boat by creating this discord, this uh, lack of harmony. Um, where we're not all on the same page. You're you're bringing that out, right? You're bringing that to the forefront of people's attention. That is a dynamic, uh, a social and cultural dynamic that discourages open exploration of disagreement, which is what we want to do here as a part of truth seeking. So the code by putting this burden of proof principle is really doing something countercultural, in my opinion. Like this, is, I've observed this pattern, um, and I think that the code is deliberately trying to go against it. That it, the, the, it's kind of like the code is saying, in my own words here, a person who disagrees with you shouldn't be put into this position of having to decide whether they want to raise a stink about that or pick their battles or something. The, the way the principle is actually worded here, let me pull it up. It says, um, here we go, uh, the burden of proof for any position usually rests on the participant who sets forth the position. If and when an opponent asks, the proponent should provide an argument for that position. So it's saying it's always fair for you to ask why. Why should I agree with that? I'm not sure I do agree with that. Why should I be convinced? Please give me an argument for this. That's always fair. That should never be a like, ooh, kind of moment where there's like this social resistance that has to be overcome. We want to invite that kind of criticism rather than put a kind of social pressure against it. Um, so I, I think that's the deeper meaning here for the burden of proof is to kind of change the the culture, the dynamic in in that sort of way. So um, that's also why I'm inviting you to criticize the code of intellectual conduct. I don't want to just talk for two hours about this whole thing and everyone's like, cool. That's sometimes what happens in the classroom. Um, if you if you want to if you actually agree with it, then I want that to be a sincere agreement. I want that to be. Um, something that has we've had the opportunity to kind of criticize it to look at it to maybe do some different things um, and then we're like yes this is a full hearty yes that we give to this 
Um, I do some other like leadership stuff outside of the school, um, a lot of stuff with my church and some other communities. And we have a phrase in the leadership at my church. Um, it's a very important principle for our community and our uh, the kind of culture that we're trying to build. But we often say, um, you can't say yes if you can't say no. If there's not the opportunity for saying no, or if you don't feel comfortable making that choice, then that takes away a little bit of the power of your yes saying. So kind of the implicit yes that happens in a social circle when someone makes a claim and no one challenges it, that's a very weak kind of yes. And we're looking for stronger yeses here. So that's what I, that honestly, this is what I want about the code. That if we're going to kind of look at the code as a pledge about how we're going to treat each other this quarter, I, if that's something that we're on the same page about, I want that to be a, a robust on the same page about sort of thing. So if you've got criticism, you're watching this video later on YouTube, so you weren't able to comment, or those of you in the chat, you want to comment about stuff on the code too, um, send me an email, uh, contact me in some way if you've got some suggestions. I'll definitely bring that up in a future video. Um, let's see. Uh, by the way, I mean, do you do people in the chat have anything as we've been kind of going through the code so far, or, or the way that I'm cashing it out that you've been like, oh, I'm not so sure about that? Oh, that's a good point. Yeah, I will uh, not forget about that. Uh, uh, yeah, let's do it right now. Um, I'm looking around me. Let's do um, Algiers, the country of Algiers. That's the code word. I know, a really weird one, but I have this board game about um, uh, the, Feren the French colonial um, uh, control of Algiers and when people rose up against the, the colonial rule of the French. So that's what's on my table. That's my code word for tonight, Algiers. Yeah, I can spell that out. Uh, but if anyone misspells it on the code, if you're watching this on YouTube, that's don't worry about it. Um, that's what it looks like. Algiers. It's in Africa. Um, did I spell it right? Uh, maybe I didn't spell that right. <laughs> I thought I spelled that right. Oh, uh, that's the city. Uh, okay, yeah. So that's the capital city. All right. Well, that's still the code word. Algiers, the city of Algeria. Okay. Um, good. Cool. Um, so we've got a little bit more time left here. Oh. About the burden of proof of the component of a different argument. Um, what do you mean by that, Alejandro? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Whether you're talking about giving a positive proposal or a negative proposal, like a criticism of someone else's view, every criticism has to be launched from somewhere. There, there, it's not like objections come from nowhere. Um, and I've actually noticed this as a tenant. Did I talk about this? I'm having weird deja vu. I don't think I talked about this in the video lecture day, uh, yesterday. Maybe I talked about it today with another one of my classes. Um, it's getting late, so the brain's not quite working at full speed. Um, so there, I've noticed a, a, a kind of conception, um, oftentimes on the internet, um, so it might just be trolling, but this kind of idea that maybe like, I don't stand for anything, I'm just calling out all your bullshit. Like, I criticize everyone else's perspectives, but I don't hold any perspectives myself that could be then criticized. I believe in nothing. That's not possible. Um... If you're going to make an, an objection to someone else's position, you're arguing for a conclusion. You're saying, this, uh, this, uh, oh, uh, Sophie, I'll definitely be doing that. As soon as this is done, I'm going to open up that, that quiz assignment. So you can't do it just yet, um, but I, I will uh, be setting that up soon. Um, 
every time you're launching an objection to someone else's position, you're arguing for a conclusion that says this idea is wrong or this argument fails or something like that. And you got to back that up with something. There has to be some reason, some positive beliefs that because these things are true, we should think this argument or position fails. Um, so every criticism does commit you to some kind of positive position, which then can be objected to. So one way of responding to an objection is to attack the premises that that objection is based on. And that's a very common way in which things work. There's really not so much a... Uh, there's not really any logical difference between um, a positive position and a negative position other than that one might not be reacting to something else directly. Um, but sometimes even positive positions are a response to something else, like maybe a shown failure in another position. That's why I want to try out a new tactic, a new, new approach. Um, so it, it really doesn't, the rules aren't different for whether you're making a positive proposal or a negative critique. You're welcome. There are some situations that can adjust burden of proof. Um, I'm... Yeah, this gets more into my kind of opinion territory, so maybe I should do this. Um, sometimes I think modern philosophy makes a big deal, a bigger deal than they should, about like which side of a debate has the burden of proof. But sometimes you'll find, especially in moral philosophy, you'll find some philosophers who are saying, you know, if your position is really counterintuitive or looks absurd or something like that, then um, it doesn't, it has the burden of proof. Like whatever is intuitive, whatever does kind of naturally make sense or what's the sort of consensus up to this point, that's not the position that has the burden of proof. So like if you wanted to say, Einstein was completely wrong. We'd be like, okay, you've got the burden of proof on that, right? Einsteinian physics shouldered its burden of proof so far. If you want to attack it, you know, good luck. <laughs> You're the one with all the onus, right? So sometimes there can be a shift of who's got the onus based on which position is kind of more controversial. Personally, I think that's largely a waste of time. There are countless philosophy papers that are written back and forth about like whose job it is to give the next argument in the debate. And I'm like, just look at the reasons. <laughs> Why are we beating around the bush on this stuff? Um, especially in ethics. But I'm also, another fair thing to know about me is that I'm generally an anti-intuitionist when it comes to ethics. I don't put a lot of stock in intuition. And some of the class, philo uh, classical philosophical theories that we're going to be looking at kind of share that skepticism. Um, I'm really concerned about bias. And I, I don't think I'm wrong to do that. Um, I think the confidence that we have in our moral intuitions, that has a burden of proof that it needs to shoulder. Just because something comes from our conscience doesn't mean it has an automatic kind of, it's not on the plus side. Uh, I'm, I'm largely skeptical of that. And I, want, I always want something more solid as uh, evidence and argument to justify a moral position. Uh, Nietzsche says something very similar. He says, for people who talk about a conscience, do they have no conscience for their conscience? Right? So like there's a there's ethics about how should you listen to your conscience or what should you do with your moral intuitions? Uh, what's the right relationship that you should have to them? And that's what his sort of clever statement about conscience of your conscience is referring to. Um, is there no accountability for your conscience? I mean, is there sometimes that stuff misfires. So uh, we'll talk about that more in the coming weeks um, as we get into issues about like is there moral truth, objective universal moral truth, and how would we ever find it? Like, how do you make an argument for this stuff? Uh, we'll be digging into that pretty deeply. Um, the, these kind of early theories we're going to talk about, I'm interested um, really directly, not just about understanding the theories and what they're saying, like what their moral perspectives are, but what I'm most interested in is that you, have, you come away with an understanding of why those philosophers were convinced of that of those positions what are the grounds on which they try to justify those proposals because otherwise it's just like yeah there's moral theories for days like everyone their dog has a moral theory great so we've got a bunch of opinions that's not really helpful but if we see like where's the force of this supposed to be coming from like why might I need to be impressed by this moral theory why why is there maybe some um, rational pressure to agree with this position, um, that we're, we've got something more to sink our teeth into. That might be a little more instructive. And there's a lot of different ways to approach that in ethics. Or well, I guess I should say, I should qualify that. Not a lot, but there are some diverse approaches for 
what counts as evidence and argument in ethics. Um, and a lot of times the difference, the big deep disagreements we have about ethics are because we're kind of playing by different ground rules about that. Um, this, this topic itself has actually been the one that's motivated me the most in my professional work and doing my own original philosophy is like, how do you have kind of standard for how we're going to have a debate about ethics that isn't question begging, that isn't um, biased, it's not privileging one position over another initially, right? It's not like you're uh, um, skewing the stakes in a debate. Um, you're not, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Ah, it's getting late. Um, It's like giving a handicap to a position at the beginning of the debate, like the putting extra weight on it that the other side's going to have to do more to overcome or something like that. How do you set up fair rules for us to sort out these questions and disagreements we have about ethics? Um, it's not privileging or prejudging any of the answers um, inappropriately. Uh, that's something I'm concerned about, with also not having like a totally watered down, trivial sort of basis from which to do this that doesn't actually give us any clear guidance? Um, where where could we find some standards that would give us some progress on this? So that, that's a really tricky issue. Uh, I know it because I've studied it and I've worked on, I've tested out my own answers against that question, um, and it's hard. Uh, but I think there is some some ideas here about how we can get some progress about it. So we'll, I'll be sharing that in the coming weeks. Um, this video is at two hours, and so I'm thinking about calling it. it it's uh, it's past ten o'clock. There's some other things from the code that we have not had the chance to talk about. In fact, one big one here, acceptability principle, in terms of criticisms I have for the code, this is one I think should be cut. It should just be cut out of the code completely. I think it's totally wrong. Um, it's kind of guilty of the things that I was complaining about with burden of proof um, and sort of where we might give one position more uh, an initial weight than another. Um, so we should talk about that, and we should talk about these resolution suspension of judgment principles. Um, these are pretty important. I, what I might do is this. Um, before Thursday, well, no, I can't do that. No, that wouldn't be fair to all of you. Yeah, I think we're just going to have to talk about the code a little bit more on Thursday. Um, so the schedule is going to be a little weird and flexible here at the beginning. I'm, it's hard for me to gauge how much time everything's going to take us. Um, I maybe was not as efficient tonight as I was hoping I would be, but uh, for those of you in the chat, like, do you feel like I was wasting your time at all, or was uh, this pretty dense? I kind of don't always have a sense. Dense? Okay, cool. I, I mean, I... What was that? Okay, cool. I it's, sometimes it's a little weird after doing this stuff for so long about like whether I'm just kind of rambling. Thank thank you for the feedback. Um, uh, or whether it's it is something like important and useful. Whether it's worth going into more detail and depth about it. Um, so I think I think I definitely have some things on the code we definitely have to talk about before leaving it behind, uh, especially in terms of like understanding it, like clarity, so you can evaluate it and criticize it, which is something else I'm inviting. Um, but we'll, uh, so we'll do the code on Thursday, try to finish that up quickly, um, and then I'll start talking about some of these other uh, things for our crash course in ethical theory. Some general stuff, like um, I want to talk a little bit about relativism, I want to talk about emotions, I want to talk a little bit about religion for the purposes of our class. Um, there's a couple things I want to say about that. Um, and maybe egoism. I might talk about egoism um, and justice. Some so uh, not, not a little small potatoes stuff. Some pretty big stuff. But I have some modest little tangents or little items to talk about with each of those things. They're not huge, big, long things. Um, and then if we have any time, we'll uh, start talking about mill and utilitarianism. So there's a lot of readings that are on this kind of early um, section and module. Uh, and check out as many of them as you can, as you have time for. I know you've got other classes and other things going on. Um, so early time here in the quarter is going to be a little looser, um, but I, I've got a lot of resources there if you get the time and want to take a look at them. If you have questions about them, let me know. I'm happy to talk them over. But I'm, I'm not planning on going really deep uh, in these video lectures in the egoism piece or the Falk article. Um, I may just touch on those a little briefly, like I've been doing, like here and there. Um, 
uh, sharing ideas that I think are relevant to what we're doing more generally here. But I do have those things on the agenda for Thursday. So, what is it? Relativism, emotions, religion, maybe a little bit on egoism, a little bit on justice. Um, like that M. Yarda Sen uh, selection on on different ideas of justice and this flute example. Is, I'll probably bring that up. It's, it's a little nice little thing. Um, justice means a whole lot of different things to different people. Um, but we can clarify those things theoretically. What are the different sort of values that people have in mind? So we'll talk about that. Um, anything from the, the chat group um, that's here tonight? Anything you want to ask before we, we sign off for the evening? You're welcome. How's everyone else doing? Cool. Yes, me too. <laughs> it's a long, long day on these Tuesdays and Thursdays. Okay, well, let's call it there. I'm going to try to stay pretty close to 10 o'clock, so... I'm not interfering with your sleep schedules and everything. Um, and hopefully I'll see you back here on Thursday. And if you're watching this on YouTube, hopefully I can see you on Thursday. If you have any questions about Google Hangouts and getting that to work, if there's anything in the in the way of you doing that, if you want to be here, let me know. and I can help you sort that out tomorrow uh, or uh, Thursday afternoon in preparation for, for Thursday night. So let me know. And I will update the quiz. I will. Okay. Um, have a good night, everyone. See ya.